So, alhamdulillah, I'm really blessed to have this opportunity to be here with everyone. <clears throat> uh, for those that were new, last week we talked about some of the early period of revelation and what was so special about the Prophet, peace be upon him. And so today we'll go into a little bit more of the early periods of history of Islam, uh, just to see how it developed and the foundation of it. Um, but before we get into that, we had a little bit of an assignment last week. So on the board, on the projector, you'll see four major themes, okay? And these are the main themes of early revelation. And one of the assignments that we talked about last week was to go through a translation of the Quran and pick a surah or a chapter that was revealed in Mecca and try and identify some of the verses that coincide with these themes just so that it also helps you that when you're reading the Quran, you understand the, the reasons of revelation, but as well as the people that the revelation was coming to, so you understand their society, their background, and you can kind of correlate and relate to them as well that way. So was anyone able to actually do that? Okay, all right. Mm-hmm. Good. So one of the chapters in the Quran is called Time or Surah Asr. Um, and it's talking about morality, right? That mankind is at a loss except for those who believe. But belief isn't enough. They have to do good. And doing good isn't just enough either. They have to unite on truth because they will be tested, right? And they will be pressured with peer pressure to succumb to falsehood. And not only do they have to do that, but they have to do so patiently, right? Because tests aren't just a one-time thing. You're going to be tested throughout your whole life. So that's one chapter that correlates with one of the same talking about morals and ethics, right? You have to believe and do good. So you have a belief system as well as a morality and a check that way. Okay? Good. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else before we move on? Okay. All right. <clears throat> All right, so now we move on, okay? The Prophet now uh, in Islam was for three period, uh, three years, for a period of about three years, was being called to secretly. So the Prophet would talk to people that he knew uh, personally and could connect with them. And then we talked about how after that period of three years, it was now being something widespread, something that was public and open, all right? The response to this was pretty much mass rejection, okay? And we talked about some of the reasons why. Uh, you guys have remember? Anyone remember some of the reasons why the majority of the people that the Prophet came to denied him? Yes. They didn't want to leave? Their lifestyle. Okay, good. So especially people that had power and were corrupt, right? In order to change, that means they had to have less power and... They would have to, you know, power can be very um, alluring, right? It's something that's very tempting. So they didn't want to change their lifestyle. Okay, what else? Very good. This is something that we'll touch on later on today too. One of the main reasons that they didn't do it was because their fathers didn't, right? They wanted to follow in the path of their fathers and their forefathers. And you'll see this often when you're reading the Quran, that this is the religion of my fathers and my forefathers, right? So when uh, Ibrahim, Prophet Abraham, comes to his father and tells him, follow me, I'm, I'm sent from God as a messenger, okay? And do not fall into this idol worship. What was his response? This is the religion of my fathers and my forefathers, right? So they stuck to it, okay? All right, very good. Anyone else? Okay, all right, let's move on. So pilgrimage season was coming up, okay? And this is something that was very common even before Islam mandated, had, you know, even before Hajj in, in Islamic history and, you know, as a pillar of our faith. Even before this, they used to, Mecca, like we talked about, was a center for trade, okay? And people would actually come from other areas and lands to come visit the Kaaba, right? The holiest mosque. And they would do pilgrimage there, right? They would come visit they would set up an idol, they would worship the different gods, they would slaughter animals in that area to a different deity, to an idol, to this, to that. 
So pilgrimage would come and they would come once a year, right, during the season. And now that the message is being open in public and spread that way, the Meccans, the people at that time, Quraysh as they're called, which is the, the, the area, the tribe, they got together and they knew that Muhammad would be there and would preach this message. So they got together, they called everyone together and they wanted to make a unified assault against the Prophet. Okay? Because if everyone was saying this, then the chances of people coming in from different lands to believe them would be higher. Because you know what, if everyone in this classroom, right, if, if someone's new to the area, and someone's like, oh, should I go eat at this restaurant? And if anyone in this room, everyone was like, no, you shouldn't, they have cockroaches in their food, or whatever. If everyone here said that, then what would be the chances of a person going there? Very slow, they, no one would go, right? But if this person was like, eh, they're okay, and that person's like, oh, they're great. This person's like, yeah, I've had better, this person... You know, if, if the message is not unified, then maybe there's a chance, okay? So they got together, they wanted a unified message so that they knew for sure no one would follow these these, this man, Muhammad. And no one would fall into this trap, quote-unquote, all right? So what did they say? They got together and they're like in a gathering kind of like this, and they're like, we should say he's a fortune teller, okay? And they're like, yeah, yeah, and then they started to say, well, you know what, let's think about it. Actually, it doesn't make any sense if we were to call him a fortune teller because his methodology, right, the message that he's preaching, is completely different than other fortune tellers. You know, he isn't some sort of like, you know, mystic guy and like the, all these things and doesn't have all these tricks and doesn't come in and he doesn't do this and he doesn't do that, right? So when you see him, you wouldn't call him like someone that was a fortune teller because they had like a specific type of aura and diff place that they would be in in a shop or whatever it is. Um, I think someone's trying to get in from one of the doors. Right. So they said, you know what? This man is nothing like a fortune teller. Okay? Maybe we should just leave that one door open, actually. <laughs> All right. So they said, one guy's like, let's call him a fortune teller. Then they thought, they, thought, they thought about it, and they're like, you know what? Does it make sense? Nothing about him says he's a fortune teller. Everyone knows what fortune tellers look like. He, does, he isn't one of them. Okay? So they said, okay, what about we call him a poet? Maybe he's not a fortune teller, he's just really good with words, right? <laughs> and the Quran kind of rhymes, so we'll just go with that. Then they thought about it, and some, a lot of the people at that time were actual poets. They said, well, actually, if we say that, it doesn't also make sense. Because the Quran, while it is rhythmic, and sometimes it does rhyme, it's not metered, right? And for poetry, it needs to be metered. There's a, there's a science behind it, okay? Nor was what he was saying poems. Right. It rhymed, it had a rhythmic tune to it, but it wasn't a poem. So this doesn't make sense. We can't call him a poet. So they said, okay, let's call him insane. They're like, yeah, he's crazy. He's a madman. And they thought about it, and they said, well, actually, if you think about it, he's a completely sane person. Right? Other than this message that he has, nothing about him is different than us. Okay? And they said, okay, well, how about we call him a sorcerer? Okay, they're like, well, they thought about it. Doesn't really fit, but you know what? <laughs> Let's just go with it. All right. Even though he didn't do things, right? Even though he wasn't a sorcerer, it had nothing about him was sorcery like. They said, you know what? We'll say he's a sorcerer, and we'll say he'll cast a spell on you. He'll do this to you, and he'll break your families apart, and he'll turn your son, the son, your sons, against your fathers. And remember how we talked about earlier? One of the reasons they followed their religion which was because of their lineage, their fathers, their forefathers. This was extremely important for them, okay? So if they were to come to a people and tell them, don't listen to him, he's going to break, he's going to turn son against his father, that's a great warning. Am I in the way? I'm sorry. <laughs> All right? So they're like, okay, let's do this. All right? So what happens, <clears throat> and this is one of the verses in the Quran that describes this, and you'll see this verse, Oftentimes, especially when we talk about early revelation, if you see this verse, you can almost guarantee that this verse was revealed in an early part of Islam because this is what they were saying about him. He says, okay. And indeed, and indeed, those who disbelieve would almost make you slip with their eyes when they hear the message. They see, say, indeed, he is mad. All right? But this is not except, he's not a reminder except 
He is not, but it does not accept a reminder to the world. This is Surah Qalam, the last two verses of it. Okay, uh, I believe it's chapter number fifty-nine. Qalam, pen, yeah. Uh, and this is the, some of the um, <coughs> the the uh, scholars of of Tafsir of Quranic commentary also say, and some of the, even in the history books of Sirah will say that these verses were actually um, this chapter was one of the first chapters revealed earlier on in Islam. Okay? So, so when they saw someone coming, they would say, he is but what? He is a madman. He's a crazy person, right? But this is not that, except but a reminder to the world. All right? And there's other verses talking about the refutation of him being a sorcerer or him being crazy, insane, or a magician, or whatever it is. All right? And what's amazing is even though they would mock the Prophet. They would, you know, they would mock them. Whenever they saw a Muslim walking the streets, they would start laughing at him. And they'd make fun of him. Right? Even though they would do this, Islam still continued to spread. Muslim, the community, would, were, was still growing. Right? And they were like, what on earth is going on? We're doing all these things. Right? They even got to a point where they would actually boycott them in an, from an economic perspective. All right? They would prohibit anyone buying and trading from Muslim people. All right? And so they said, you know what? We have to step up our game. Because what we're doing is not enough. All right? So what did they do? It went from humiliation to persecution. All right? Someone, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll highlight him. His name is Bilal ibn Rabah. Radiallahu He was a, a servant or a slave at that time. Now, they couldn't walk around and persecute the Prophet physically because the Prophet came from an honorable lineage. He belonged to an honorable tribe. Okay? And this is one of the, actually the miracles of it is that one of the most honorable men from their communities came to them as a reminder and a Prophet from amongst them. Okay? But you know what? Because he belonged to a, a large tribe, they couldn't do anything to him because then their tribe could retaliate. Even if all the people in his tribe didn't believe him, they still had that sense of tribalism. Right, where it doesn't matter what our members do, they're from our tribe, so we'll protect them. But this didn't apply to poor people. We talked about the oppression that they used to do. This also didn't apply to slaves. So the poor and the weak, whether physically or so socially, amongst them were persecuted. One of these men was named Bilal bin Rabah. He's probably the most famous slave in the history of the world. Okay. He was someone who had accepted Islam. And because of this, he was punished. He was dragged out to the middle of the desert. Okay? And if anyone's ever been to, you know, just an hour probably east, you can probably find some desert areas. You ever been to Texas, there's definitely some deserts there. Right? You ever been to the Middle East, there's a lot of desert there, especially Saudi Arabia. They would drag him out. Right? And if you've ever walked into the sand or on the dirt when it's hot, even just walking outside on pavement when it's hot, it really burns. Okay, they would take him and they would put him on his back, and they would get these big boulders and rocks, and they would put it on his chest, and they would push it in. So you know, like when you're grilling something or you're frying something, you take your spatula and you press down on it. You hear that that loud noise because the oil and the meat is burning or whatever. They would do this to a man. Okay, they would take his body and dig it deep into the sand, and burn his back, and they would yell to him. Abandon this faith, abandon this faith. Now, imagine the strength and courage it takes for someone not to abandon this faith, right? In fact, he would actually respond to them. Okay? He would respond to them by saying, No, I won't, no, I won't, or I believe, you know, the testimony of faith, he would repeat it. And then finally, they would repeat, they would hear him repeating these two words, Ahadun Ahad, Ahadun Ahad, one, one, right? What is he referencing? One God, one God, Allah, right? And the reason they would say, I asked him, what, why would you say this specifically? Why don't you say these other things? He said, I would change what I would say to them to see which one would make them the most angry at me. And I found that this would make them the angriest at me. So I would keep repeating it at them, right? So while they're punishing him physically, 
he's kind of retaliating verbally, right? Like one, one, like I'm never, ever, ever, ever going to listen to what you say in a million years, right? And this would infuriate them. They would get so frustrated. They would do worse and worse and worse. So eventually, we talked about some of the early Muslims of Islam. One of the companions, the closest friend of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his name is Abu Bakr. He walked up to the owner of Bilal and he said, how much would you sell him for? So he gave a negotiated price and he, Abu Bakr bought him and freed him. Okay. And so on his way, when they're done with the deal, right, they make the transaction, he's now a freed man, so he doesn't have to go through this torture. He's a freed man now and so after the transaction is done, the guy turns to him and he says, ha, you paid 10 times as much as I wanted for him originally, right? As in, I like jacked the price up so much. I got 10 times what I would have sold him to you. If you had just negotiated, I would have sold him to you for cheaper. So Abu Bakr turns to him and he says, I paid one-tenth of the price I was willing to pay. As in, I would have paid even 10 times more to make sure that he got his freedom, okay? And this is one of the statuses of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. He was a man who, because of him, so many people entered into Islam. Um, as well as so many people, he would go and just buy slaves and free them, right? And that was just a testimony to his character. The other family that was persecuted heavily was the family of Yasir, right? His wife Sumayya and their son Ammar. And we talked about them last week, that they were literally tortured to death. Yasir and his wife Sumayya, they actually stabbed her and they killed her, okay? Yeah, and she was the first martyr in Islam, okay? Now their son Ammar, under difficult persecution, had a moment of weakness where he actually said, okay, fine, I'll leave Islam. So he came to the Prophet Muhammad and he told him, look, I was being tortured and punished, and in a moment of weakness, I, I submitted to them. But I don't believe anything that I said. So the Prophet said, that's okay. And verses were revealed that anyone who does so, is, it's not a problem. If you're persecuted to the point like that, and you were to succumb to something like this, then as long as you don't intend to actually leave it, then you're okay. All right? So these were some of the families. <clears throat> and because of this, the surrounding areas of Mecca began to hear of the Prophet Muhammad. Okay? And many of these places were actually awaiting for a Prophet to come from amongst them because of earlier scripture that had been there. Okay? So some of the tribes and different people that had followed religions at that time they had some scriptures, so some of them were Abrahamic, right? So we're talking about some of the Jewish tribes. They were awaiting a prophet, but they thought it would come from them, not from the Arab, Arabs, okay? One of the people that had come from the outside, from an area um, between Syria and Mecca, his name was Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, okay? And he was one of the men leading their... Uh, <laughs> a man, a leader from amongst this area. Okay. He came to the Prophet Muhammad And he said You know what He came to this area He met a man named Ali Ali is the cousin of the Prophet And we talked about One of the youngest And probably one of the first people That had accepted Islam Alright So he came and he accepted he, Ali followed He followed Ali And they met in secrecy Because even though the message was open People that wanted to become Muslim Would do so secretly So as not to get like Punished or tortured Alright Um, so he came, he accepted Islam And they're like, okay, good Now, don't tell anyone here But go back to your people And let them know about Islam And he's like, you know what, forget that <laughs> I'm going to go outside right now And tell everyone I'm Muslim right now So he walks up, he walks up to the Kaaba And he starts yelling I bear witness that there is no God But worthy of worship except for Allah And the Muhammad is a prophet And so people are like, what? Who is this dude, right? So they walk up to him they don't recognize any tribe that he's from or whatever. They start beating him up. All right. They start beating him up and beating him up until the uncle of the prophet, who was not a Muslim at this time, his name was Abbas. He knew who this man was. He's, he was from an area called Ghifar. So he's like, stop, stop, right? Now the Meccans would actually do a lot of trade from this area. Okay. So if they did anything bad to this guy and he went back to his tribe and he told them, then that meant that they would lose money. So he's like, stop, stop. Do you know where he's from? He's from this place. Stop. Would you want them to come back or to stop dealing with us in trade? What is wrong with you guys? Stop doing this, right? So they left him alone. Okay? And so Abu Dhar Ghifari, he was like, all right, cool. So they left him alone. 
And he's like, you know what? I'm going to do it again. So he comes back the next day, and he does the same thing. He goes up to the Kaaba. He starts yelling out, I bear witness that there's no God but Allah, and that Muhammad is his messenger and a prophet. So a different group of people are like, who is this dude? No one recognizes him. They start beating him up again, right? And so the Prophet's uncle Abbas comes. He's like, stop, stop. Do you know who this guy is? If you do this to him, the people will retaliate. They won't give us, they won't trade, blah, blah, blah. Okay? And so that was just one of the stories of that. And actually, a couple other people like this would do this. Um, so for instance, the famous companion Umar, radiallahu anhu, when he had accepted Islam, he also did something similar. But they knew who he was. And because of, you know, he was so tall and so physically, like, strong, that even though they would fight, he wouldn't end up getting that badly hurt. They said he was so tall that when he sat on a horse, his legs would drag. So like, just like your legs are dragging on like a chair, his legs, he was that tall, right? So like seven foot four, maybe pro basketball player if he was alive today, you know. <laughs> Anyways, um, so they would actually meet uh, in a house called Dar al-Arqam or the house of Arqam, who was a companion early on. He gave up his house. He said, look, we need a place to meet. We need a place to learn and study from you, Prophet Muhammad. So you can use my house. So they would meet there. Uh, and a lot of companions actually um, accepted Islam during this time. Okay. Now, what about some of the Muslims that weren't that strong or were facing persecution? We're talking now for a long period of time. We're not talking about for like one incident or two incidents. We're talking about boycotts, right, that lasted years. We're talking about family members that were disowned from their family. Didn't have any money now because of this. Okay? We're talking about something for a year or two or three or four. We're talking about almost half a decade, even up to a decade. Okay? What about these Muslims? What are they going to do? All right. <coughs> so they began looking for places that would give them safety. All right. And so the Prophet, peace be upon him, knew of a just ruler and king. Okay? And he was Christian in a place called uh, Abyssinia. All right. um, this man, and Najash, he was the king of Abyssinia. <clears throat> Over a dozen Muslims initially went there. All right. Even the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, her name was Ruqayya, and her husband is the famous companion Uthman, uh, which many of us, if you read a uh, history book, you'll see books dedicated to this man's life. All right. So, <clears throat> about 13, 14 people pack up, they move there, and the people of Quraysh, the people living in Mecca, hear about this, all right? And they weren't going to let them go without a fight. So what do they do? They followed them, all right? They followed them all the way to Abyssinia, and when they got there, they took with them gifts, pleasantries, whatever, right? To show, like, to give them gifts and to show the king that they're nice people, blah, 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 all right? And then they come to him and they tell him this, all right? They say, there is some of us, some of our people, why are you here? Why are you giving me all these gifts? So they said to him, there are some young fools from our people that have sought refuge in your kingdom. They left the religion of their people. And remember how we talked about earlier, this was a big no-no. Your father, your grandfather, your forefathers, they did this, you followed in the same way. They said, these people did a big no-no. They left the religion of our forefathers. They left the religion of their people. But you know what? They didn't even come to embrace Christianity, right? Because they, he was a Christian king. They didn't embrace, they left our religion and they're not following your religion either. Okay? They came with a fabricated religion. They just made something up. Which no one, neither one of us recognizes it. It's something foreign and completely, totally different and random. The noblemen among their people have sent to us. Okay. So these people that have come here, they're not even noble people. The noble people from our area, they sent us to come to you to bring them home back to their parents, their uncles. And you know what? We know best how to deal with our own people. So don't intervene. Okay. So the king now with his bishops and his advisors, they're like, you know what? These people sound like they know what they're talking about. Give them back. He says, hold on a second. Remember, this, we're talking about somebody that was just. And this is actually a lesson for us, right? Whenever we hear one side of the story, realize there's always another side of the story. Okay? So this is a lesson to derive from this story. All right? Ja'far, the cousin of the Prophet, he says, so they're called. Okay? And Ja'far is the older brother of Ali. 
Who is Ali? The cousin of the Prophet, one of the first people that became Muslim. And the man that led Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, right, the guy from uh, the other al-Ghifar, to the Prophet to accept Islam. His older brother Ja'far says, Dear King, we were an ignorant people. We didn't know what we were doing. We worshipped idols and ate the meat of dead animals, right? So you just walk outside, you see roadkill, they would eat it. Okay? We were used to lewd behavior. We broke family ties. We harmed our neighbors. The strong amongst us oppressed the weak. This is how we lived until God sent to us a messenger whose nobility and honesty we had been fully aware of. We knew who he was. He wasn't some random Joe that came from another area. It was like, hey guys, you want to buy this thing, right? We knew who he was. We knew he was noble. We knew he was an honest man. <clears throat> he called us to worship only God and to give up our inherited worship of statues and idols. He told us to stop doing these things that we had inherited from our family, these religious practices. He told us to speak the truth, fulfill promises, keep family relations, and be kind to our neighbors. These are all good things he's listing now. He forbade us from evil and bloodshed, shamelessness, lies, and deceit. He told us to stop misappropriation of orphans' properties. So when there was an orphan at that time, they would take his wealth, and he would never inherit it. He would never get it. Okay? He taught us to stop doing this, to stop stealing the rights of orphans and their property, and to avoid, avoid false accusations. No longer are we now allowed to lie against people, and because our tribe is bigger than their tribe, we get what we want. No more of that. He taught us to pray, to give charity, and to fast. So you see how he breaks it up, right? The first, he talks about the morals and the ethics. We talked about this last week, right? Because that's what gets people's attention. Then he told us what to stop and to avoid, right? These moral and these issues of morality and ethics. Now he tells us, what is this religion he came with? He taught us to fast, to pray, to give charity. We believed in him and acted on his teachings. So we worshipped only God and no one else. So this is our story and why we're here. We, he came to us with this message. We believed him. We followed him. We worshipped only God and no one else. We forbade what we were forbidden to do. We did, we enjoyed what was lawful, what was made lawful to us. So we followed these teachings, right, of morals and ethics and fasting and prayer. This is why our people turned against us. Now he's making against a case against the people that followed him there. He said, this is all we're trying to do. And because of this, that's why they came. They tortured us. They tried to make us worship idols instead of God and consider the lawful, the indecencies that we used to do. So these things that they still do, oppressing the weak and all that stuff, they want us to think that that's okay. But we won't do it. So when they oppressed us because of this, we came here. Okay. We sought protection in your land because we know you're just. We chose you over others. See, now he's, he's talking. He's a very, you read this? Very political, right? We chose you, O king, because... We hope that it would be safe here and we would not be oppressed. Right? Now they're talking to someone that's just. So if someone came to you and you consider yourself a just, honorable person, they come to you saying, we need your help because you're a just and honorable person, what are you going to do? You're going to be just and honorable, right? You're going to give them help. So this is what he says to him, right? We came to you because we knew you wouldn't let us go back to these people and be oppressed with them. So he asks, he says, okay, these verses of Revelation, you talked about all these things. Do you have any verses with you, right? Let me hear what it is that you guys are calling to. So one of the verses that was revealed here, we're talking about verses that had been revealed prior, about uh, stories of prior generations. One of the chapters that had been revealed at this time was the chapter of Mary, right, the 19th chapter. So he knows that he's a Christian king. So what does he decide to recite? He recites verses about Mary and Jesus, Okay. And this is the Arabic from verse 16 to 21. And he says, the verses, and mentioned in the book Mary, when she withdrew from her family to a place toward the east. And she took in seclusion from them a screen. Then we sent to her our angel, and he represented himself to her as a perfect man. She said, 
Indeed, I seek refuge in the most merciful from you. So leave me if you should be fearing of Allah. So he replies to her and says, I am only the messenger of your Lord to give you the news of a pure boy. She said to him, How can I have a boy while no man has touched me and I have not been unchaste? He says to her, Thus it will be. Your Lord says, It is easy for me and we will make him a sign to the people and a mercy from us. And it is a matter already decreed. So he repeats, he recites verses of the story of Mary and the immaculate uh, birth of Jesus to the Christian king. Very smart idea, right? So after hearing these verses, the king and all his advisors, they began to cry. Because they knew it was the truth. They believed in this, right? They believed in it, so they began to cry. After these verses, he regains his composure, the king, and he says, These verses and what was, give, and what was given to Jesus are two rays emanating from the same source, from the same light. So they're given protection. Now the people of Quraysh weren't going to give up so easily. All right. So like, okay, all right. We lost the battle, but not the war, right? We'll come back tomorrow. We'll get these people back to our lands. Okay? So they come to him the next day, and they say, you know what these people say about Jesus? They insult him. They mock him. They make fun of him. He's just a slave, they call him. So at hearing this, he's like, what? <laughs> they didn't tell me that yesterday. Get these people here, right? So they bring the Muslims again. So again, Ja'far is called. And he says, what do you guys say about Jesus? And so Ja'far tells him, again, very, very, very smart. He says, we only say what our prophet taught us. Jesus is the servant of God and his messenger. He is his word and spirit that he inspired to the Virgin Mary. Now Muslims, we believe that Jesus is the word of God and the spirit of God, but not in the divine sense, but in the sense that this is a house of God, we are people of God, and that we are owned by God, right? So God's word and spirit in the sense that we are owned by him, not necessarily that Jesus is divine or a part of, physically a part of God, okay? So he tells the king this, and he says, this is what we believe about Jesus, right? Because when God said, be and he was, that's the word of God, right? So we believe in this. So in the Jashi, the king picks up a small stick. He bends down, he picks up a small stick off the floor. He says, by God, Jesus did not say anything more than the length of this stick that is different than what you said. As in everything that what you said about Jesus and what Jesus said about himself is the same. So you guys are free to live here and you are welcome. All right? And upon hearing this, these people walked back to their, they went back to their tribe very, very sad. Right? They're like, dang it, we failed. Right? And then when the Muslims in Mecca heard this, some of them were like, oh wow, this is great news. They've been given protection. So more people actually went and moved to Abyssinia. Uh, we have uh, two more minutes. I'll end with uh, another thing. After they went back, they said to them, they said, okay, we failed at bringing these people back. How can we trick them to coming back willingly? Because we can't go in there and fight against the king for, you know, 15 people. They're not worth it. But how can we get these people coming back? Because now they know other Muslims are secretly moving to Abyssinia as well. How can we get them to come back? I know what we'll, we'll do. We'll trick them into thinking that it's safe for them to come back here now. So after a period of time, Muslims are living in Abyssinia. Obviously, some of them would get homesick, right? They're living in a different country. Yeah, they're not being persecuted, but they're not amongst their family, their friends, the money that they left. It's a different area, different society. They got homesick. So then rumors came from Quraysh. They sent them false rumors telling them, oh, it's now safe for Muslims to live in Mecca. So some of them were like, hold on a second. <laughs> this doesn't sound like the people we just left, right? That were oppressing us and using all their money against us and chased us here and lied about us and came back the next day and made even more lies against us. This doesn't sound like these people. They wouldn't quit like that. We're going to stay here. This doesn't sound like it actually happened. Some of them were so homesick that were like, we'll risk it, man. 
we'll take it. We'll take the chance. It's a gamble, but we're so homesick. We want to go back to our fam- family, our friends, our houses, our society, our area we grew up in. So they went back, and unfortunately for them, it was actually a false rumor, right? So then they actually faced even more persecution. Some of them were jailed um, and imprisoned, actually. So um, that was the story of the first migration. Some of the lessons we can take from these stories, all right? We'll open it up now, and then we have about 10, 15 minutes of open question and answer. So I have some lessons. I've mentioned some of them. Now I want you guys to share with me some lessons you take from this critical and very important story uh, about early period of Islam. So the first question is, why is this such an important and critical story? Good. So we're going to face persecution, but we don't have to sacrifice our religion for it. There's a lot of people in other parts of the world that are going through a lot worse than we are, right? And if you actually look at it, right, the concept that this country is built on the freedom of religion, while we might see stories on the news and propaganda and from media outlets and stuff like that, at the end of the day, we're at least free to practice our religion here, right? You know, very, you know, very graciously. We're grateful. I mean, imagine that we lived in the society of like Mecca. Right, we live in just our our society in our times is like lavish luxury compared to them. Okay, so there's one lesson to take from them, right? While we may disagree with the you know um, different people in different times, whatever, at least we have the freedom to practice our religion. Okay, very good. Mm-hmm. Good. So the first one is that Ardullahi wasa. It's a verse, a part of the verse in the Quran where, you know, the land of God is is wide, right? So you don't have to live in one certain place or whatever to be a Muslim. You can live wherever you are as long as you're free to practice your religion, right? Could be Tennessee, right? Could be California, could be Malaysia, could be Canada, could be Saudi Arabia. Okay, doesn't have to be. In, you don't have to live in this land or that land. You can live wherever you, as long as you're free to practice your religion. Okay. There's nothing wrong with going about. And the other one was? Um, <coughs> yeah. Very good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The other was the way that Jafar talked and taught what Islam preaches, right? So whenever we teach someone about Islam or someone asks us about Islam, we make it relatable to what they go through in their life and how they can recognize it. Because everyone's life experience is a little bit different, right? So for someone that was a Christian, he related it to him from a, in, a, in a Muslim slash Christian sense, in the sense of, look, we love Jesus and Mary just as much as you guys do, right? And these verses are really just beautiful verses that soften their hearts, right? Even to this day, as she said, if you read them, they'll soften your heart too, Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So he showed the period of ignorance that they used to live in. While they did do some good stuff, he showed them the bad stuff that they were called away from so that they wouldn't fall into it again. Right. And again, if someone asks you now, because when people know that you're Muslim, sometimes you might be one of the only Muslims that they've ever met. I have some friends, you know, in Texas, when I lived there. Sometimes these people, some people just didn't even know what, they had never met a Muslim before in their life, right? I've asked my friends, how many Muslims do you know? And they'll be like, you know what, you're the only one. So whether we realize it or not, we are kind of the face of the religion to, these, to other people. So he showed them and he showed them, this is what we used to do, and now this is what we're called to do and what we've done, okay? Very good. What are the lessons and 
what can we extract from the story that we can relate to ourselves? Perseverance and not giving up, right? Very good. You could have easily said, you know what? You guys caught us. <laughs> you followed us all the way here. All right, let's go, right? But they didn't. Okay. Even some of the ones earlier, some of the ones that didn't migrate, right? Like, for instance, Bilal. He was tortured and punished so much, but he never gave up. In fact, he wanted to make them even angrier at him because he didn't care about them, right? So he was like, you guys are going to do this to me? I'm going to make you mad, right? You physically harm me, I'm going to retaliate, make you even show you that there's absolutely zero, zero hope in me coming back to what you're telling me to follow. So good. Yes. Mm. Good. So, you know what? We'd rather face some, you'd rather face tests and trials here than on the day of judgment, right? And there's some truth to that because if we talked about one of the first verses we opened with earlier today was about being patient, right? Um, all mankind is, is at loss except for those who believe and do good and enjoy on what is the truth and do so patiently, right? Because there's going to be opportunities for us to falter, right? So being patient at a time of difficulty because you know that it's going to come to an end, but you know what? The reward you get for it is everlasting. Right? So, there you go. Habash. Abyssinia. So it shows you that Muslims don't have a monopoly on being good people, right? <laughs> Sometimes we have like this kind of thought process that, uh, you know, very unfortunate. Muslims don't have a monopoly on good people, right? There's, this man was a just king and a ruler, and he was a Christian. Okay, and that's actually very important. Because sometimes we get caught up so much in like the theology of things that we leave the actual morality and ethics of people. Okay, and so that's just as important for us to individualize and to realize between people. Very good. And they chose him because of his moral character. Uh, it's in Africa. I can pull up a map for you and show it to you. Different places. Um, I believe it's near Ethiopia. Yeah, I believe so. I'll have to double check for you. But yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, there's reason to believe it could be. Yeah, it could be. I, to be honest with you, I don't know for sure in detail whether it knows or not. Sorry. <laughs> but, yeah. <coughs> mm -hmm. uh, so some as early, like, when did, like, um, Christianity kind of um, differ from what Jesus had preached early on? You probably say within maybe a century yeah yeah so this was this was yeah yeah yeah
Yeah. Yeah, and we get this. We get a lot of questions at presentations. They say, you believe in what Jesus said? We tell them, yes, but obviously, um, there's a little difference on what maybe some of the gospel writers wrote, right? So we may differ with them. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. So you you look at like the gospel writers, for instance, and then you can see some of the shift start there. Yeah. So. Yeah, so we believe 100% in Jesus and his message. We don't believe the current message about Jesus. So that's one way to, it's kind of like a tongue twister. But we believe in the message of Jesus, but we don't believe what is said about him uh, theologically in his divinity and things like that. So for instance, there are some Bibles with black text and red text. The red text would be the actual words of Jesus that they're quoting. And the black text is writing commentary about him. So we'll believe the red text, but not the black text. So. So we don't believe his resurrection because we don't believe his death. But we do believe that Jesus will come back. So, no, so at the time of the Mahdi, right, when the Mahdi comes, we believe Jesus will come back. But we don't believe that he ever died. So we don't believe in resurrection, but we believe he will come back. Yeah. 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 So that's also an important distinction. But yeah. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So we believe all the prophets made sujood, right? Prostration. And in a sense, Muslim as in the one who submits themselves. Okay. So that's why in the Quran you even see um, Abraham being referred to as a Muslim, right? In the sense that he submits himself to God. Okay, very good. All right, we have about three minutes left uh, for any questions and comments. <laughs> Sorry, cool. What's your name, young man? What's your name? All right, he doesn't have a name, alhamdulillah. He's very cute, mashallah. <laughs> uh, mashallah, he's a, our youngest member. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Okay. All right. Um, Jazakallah khair. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this a gathering of gathering of uh, purity and uh, blessing. And bless us always in our path. And may he make us those who strive to come closer to him as well. Ameen. Subhanak rabbil azzati ammi al-safun wa salamun ala musarin wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Jazakallah khair. Thank you all for showing up. Um, and assalamu alaikum. Uh, quick